for all of us as taxpayers, a lot of those folks are just going to be pushed on to Medicaid. And what's interesting, being in Congress the last year and a half, and i got to be honest with you, I'll give you a little congressional inside baseball. Most Democrats in Washington, they're scared to death of this issue. And Tammy Duckworth, the woman I'm going to run against, hi, Tammy. Um, <laughs> she doesn't even want to talk about Obamacare. President Obama will spend the next eight months trying to get reelected, because that's his job. He wants to get reelected. And he's going to try to do it without even talking about Obamacare. <clears throat> Just fascinating to me again. If you really believe in it, why aren't you out there pounding your chest every day? Tammy's got to defend it. She said she supports it. In fact, Tammy said she supports universal government-run health care. I want to hear you defend that. This should be the most important issue of this election. Here's why, folks. Here is why. Wake up and grow up, country. We all got to grow up. There's so much. There's so much that we fight about. There's so much we've got government doing that we don't want government doing. Oil subsidies, you name it. Go on down the line. Come home from Afghanistan. Get rid of the Department of Education. Boy, that'll be on tape. Um, there's so much, there's so much we don't want government doing where government wastes a lot of money. But the big elephant in the room that Republicans and Democrats for too long, shame on them, have been afraid to talk about because they're worried about getting you all angry. Medicare, Social Security. Because you know the rule is, the minute a politician uh, touches Medicare, the rule is seniors are going to go after you. Oh, you're done. You can't talk about that. And that's what's happened. And that's what's happened. Whether you like me or don't like me, you got to be honest with me. You got to agree with me about one thing. I went to Washington to get in the hide of Republicans and Democrats. As a Republican, I probably hit my own party over the head more than anybody I know in Congress. Because Republicans screw up a lot. And Republicans play politics with issues all the time. But to my Democrat friends in the audience, I'm going to tell you on this one, on the fact that 10,000 baby boomers are retiring a day, and oh, by the way, they're not living till they're 63. They're living till they're 93. You've got about 30 years to go. <laughs> We're living longer, and more and more of us are retiring. And baby, that's a great thing. As a country, we should pat ourselves on the back. But as a country, I don't care if what I'm about to say doesn't get me reelected. As a country, we need to grow up and have a big boy and big girl discussion about how we pay for all that health care. And to ignore it is criminal. And I love, I love it when uh, Tammy and the other Democrats say, oh, that Joe Walsh, he wants to end Medicare as we know it. As we know it. I've been told to say, as we know it. Folks, I'll look into the camera. If we don't change Medicare and fix it and reform it, it won't be there for my kids and grandkids. It won't be there for your kids and grandkids. And you know what? Every Democrat and Republican in Washington knows that. They all know it. And I know it's a lot easier to just say, don't touch it, don't touch it. Ooh, if those Republicans, that Paul Ryan plan, if they're going to touch it, we'll get them politically. Shame on them. On this one, Democrats are playing politics. And as I've told the media all week, ain't going to work. Because I don't care if you're 90, 70, 50, or 30 years old, you're tired of this stuff. And you get it. You understand now. Because we kind of have grown up. You understand that we got 10,000 baby boomers retiring a day. And they're living till they're 93. And they're playing golf with new knees, new hips, new eyes, new everything. That's all good stuff. But how are we as a country going to pay for this. That is, the, that is the biggest piece of the federal pie, and it's the fastest growing. And to ignore it, to ignore it, 
is criminal to what you're doing to our kids and our grandkids. If you want to put your head in the sand and say, don't touch my Medicare, don't do anything to Social Security, you are going to have to look at your kids and your grandkids in 30 years, because you'll still be around, and apologize. Sorry it's not there for you. I think we're better than that. This is what this election should be about. And what I said during the last campaign is what I'm still saying now. We as a country can't afford Medicare and Medicaid right now unless we fix it. And President Obama knew that. And two years ago, he dumped another big entitlement on us without even thinking about it. And now we're in a lot of trouble because I've got somebody here who knows a lot more than I do, but I've read and I've been told that the average family of four in this country will pay about $20,000 a year in health insurance within three to four years. Premiums are going up. Family doctors, I believe family physicians, will be like dinosaurs in eight to 10 years. Private insurance, they'll be, they'll be gone in eight to 10 years. <laughs> I so wish, <clears throat> the thing that makes me so sad about this job is, this shouldn't be a surprise, there's so little honesty. I so wish Republicans and Democrats could be honest. I wish my opponent could be honest. I wish the president could be honest. Because I think if he were here right now and he were honest, he'd tell us, Walsh, I hear what you're saying. And the way to fix all of this is, I really do want everybody on government-run health care. That's a legitimate position. I wish he would just say it and defend it. I'm going to stop right now and just <coughs> say, The Republicans put out the Ryan budget a week or two ago, last week, excuse me. I don't know whether I'm going to vote for it or not. The reason I may not vote for it will probably surprise a lot of people in the audience. We can talk about that later. But I just want you to remember something. Republicans, independents, and Democrats in this audience. Your Democrat Senate hasn't put forth a budget in three years. In fact, I'm on a bill that says, I just got on a bill a week ago that says, if, if you, the House, doesn't pass a budget every year, you don't get paid. That's like the basic of what we should do, okay? So the Senate hasn't even passed a budget in three years. We have a president <coughs> who put forth a budget a month and a half ago, this scares me, that never, ever, ever, ever balances. Now, I don't know how you can do that. So here come the Republicans, and you may not like what the Republicans did, but they said, hmm, I know Medicare is going to be insolvent in eight years, and so I'm going to propose a reform. I know a lot of people won't like it, but I hope we get a discussion started. I know as a country, we're $16 trillion in debt right now, and that's a problem. So I'm going to cut spending and try to balance the budget. Now, even the big, bad Paul Ryan budget, the big, bad Republican budget, that big, mean Republican budget, don't take that part, it doesn't even balance for 28 years. The Republican budget and that big, bad <coughs> Ryan Republican budget says to all of us, if you're 55 or older in this country, Nothing changes. When it comes to Medicare, Social Security, nothing changes. Because even we were so afraid to talk honestly to seniors. Now, I know we have nobody 55 or older in this room. But so you know, if you're 55 or older, you're done. You're set. We just said for folks younger, we're going to have to do something different or it won't be there for them. I am tired of politicians who don't have the courage to look the American people in the eyes and say, we got a problem, we got to do something about it. You may not like what the Republicans said, but at least they acknowledged we have a problem and we got to do something about it. I'm going to stop there. <coughs>
I am going to introduce a doc and a uh, private insurance expert. I'm going to give them a few minutes to talk about a subject. Thank you. Uh, and then we're going to open it up to just our informal Q&A. And I'd like our informal Q&A to focus on Obamacare, healthcare, Medicare. Sort of all in that wall. And let's just get, let's, let's walk out of here in about an hour, at least having learned something, wherever we are on the issue. And remember my ground rule, respect each other. Dr. Rich Ferolo, come on up. Wait, move the microphone, should I grab it? No, he's good. Okay. I'll cut you off too, don't worry. I thought I was a dinosaur already. I'm a single doctor, family doctor, work with myself. And I'm here because I want to work for you. I see a lot of seniors here. You guys are my favorite patients. It's my lowest paying patient uh, base, my favorite patients. You guys treat us with utmost respect. You guys come in docking you to cut the hand off, cut more. Go ahead, you know what you're doing. Compared to the Generation Xers, they spent 20 minutes on the internet, and I got a debate mess. By the way, folks, if, if you can't hear him, raise your hand, I'm gonna put the mic in front of him. <clears throat> Go ahead, Rich. I wanna work for you. I don't wanna work for the government. I don't want to work for the healthcare industry or the hospital. I have a moralistic problem with that because when you come to me, you're my boss. When I work for them, they're my boss. That's it. Now, I'm going to tell you what I told Joe the first night I met him. And the same thing I've been telling my patients since Hillary Care. Any politician, I don't care what side of the aisle, who talks about fixing the healthcare system without fixing the legal system, Either number one doesn't understand the problem, that's a nice way of saying he's not so smart. Or number two, he's ignoring the problem. That's a nice way of saying he's corrupt. What I mean by corrupt is they're putting the lawyers before the patient. <coughs> okay? You guys should be put first. You guys should be in charge of your health care. Not the government, not your insurance company, not your employer. Now. We all have different views on health care, but I bet we would all agree, it's too expensive. Too expensive. Obamacare does nothing to make it less expensive. Nothing. What can we do to make it less expensive? A couple things, tort reform. We'll talk about that. How do the FDA approval process, how we handle the end of life and patient responsibility. Tort reform. Most people think tort reform is lowering my malpractice. That is the smallest part. Bigger is product liability. Every piece of medical equipment, every drug, even the car that you drive, there's product liability put into this. The costs are astronomical. Most of you, I hope, had your flu shot. Half the cost of that, product liability. A pint of blood, third, product liability. That's got to change. Reduce the lawsuits and reduce the cost. Now, lawsuits. The lawsuits doctors face are astronomical. Now, there's a difference between malpractice and maloutcome. I'm sure a lot of you got some good docs. Some are great docs. But no matter what they do for you, we're all going to die. Now, that's not malpractice, that's what? a bad outcome. <laughs> Oh, go ahead. That's a bad outcome. But it's not malpractice. Unfortunately, as physicians, we get sued for maloutcome. And as society, we all pay for it. Just like the lady who put the hot cup of coffee between her legs and burned herself. We all pay for that next time we go to McDonald's. This has to stop. The insurance company I work for, 87% of the cases of malpractice, the doctors win. We have to stop all those cases going to trial. It's too expensive. How can we make these less costly? Well, how about lowering the contingency fees for lawyers? Please, if there's any lawyers sneaking behind me, let me know. I don't get that. It's a third. Why not make it 10%? Plus, if you want to bring a malpractice suit, let's say it goes against a board, three doctors, three lawyers. They decide if it's malpractice. And if it is, you go through the normal process. If it's not, you can still sue, but lose your pays. As physicians, when we get sued, we risk our homes. Doctor, you have
have malpractice insurance. Yeah, but there's limits to it. If they ask more, they can go after the doctor's assets. I'm concerned about my kids and grandchildren who are going to take care of them. Because right now, if you've got kids about 2021, 20, it doesn't make sense to go into medicine and do what I do. One of my good friends, he's a lawyer, he's one of those one percenter guys, refused to let his kids go into medicine. He's a money guy, he says, it's not, it doesn't make sense for economic return. What else can we do? The FDA approval process. Drugs are too expensive. Right now it takes anywhere from $500 million to $2 billion to bring a drug to market. Average $800 million. That's expensive. That's ridiculous. Streamline the process. One of the things we can do is, if a drug passes FDA approval, you can't sue the drug company. Now, I'm a small government guy, but we have to have government oversight of this. If the drug company gets caught cheating, somebody goes to jail. And I'm not talking Blago jail, I'm talking real jail. Okay? All right, next. End of life. We have to change that. There are studies that show all the money you spend in your health care, between 10 and 50 percent, big range, is spent in the last few months of your life. That's got to change. If a patient comes to me and they have uh, terminal disease, I sit them down. I say to them, I need to know what you want to do at the end of life. I don't need to know now, but what I would like to do is all I can to extend your life, but not prolong your death. Think about that. Extend your life, but not prolong your death. You got to remember, the baby boomers, there's five of us for every one of you seniors. But when we get older, there's only two and a half behind us. For our generation, they won't be able to do for us what we do for you guys. So we have to make a change for our generation. Realistic change. Again, I want the docs to work for the patients, not the government, not the employer. joined by another doc and I'm going to bring him up and let him talk about whatever he wants for a couple minutes. Dr. Dennis Keller. I was actually I'm a critical care doctor and a pulmonologist. I was working and just found out about it. So, um, Thank you. Sure, thanks. Uh, you know, I had a town hall meeting or was in a town hall meeting with the, um, with the chief executive uh, for advocacy and for a lot of us doctors, especially for what I do, critical care and pulmonary. Um, yes, yes, yes. Go. Yeah, a lot of what I do is is hospital hospital based medicine. At the bottom. Yeah. What? This one's better. All yours. And the conversation that, that we actually had, or they had with the group of physicians, was how they were rolling out their ACO. And part of Obamacare um, requires these ACOs, either health, either hospitals, or groups of physicians, or, or groups of health systems, to control lives, essentially, and expenditures of, of, those, uh, of those patients. And part of this ACO is rolling out an MSSP, a Medicare Shared Savings Plan. And what they were essentially asking us to do is to give us the names and addresses of all of our Medicare patients. And I was one of the few people who raised my hand and, and I, I asked for clarification. Um, and they are asking for us to give them the names and addresses for our Medicare patients because they can't go to Medicare to get it, but they want to put you into their system. They want to track where you're going and what you're doing, and they want us to be able to push you to their facilities for their testing. This is what they want. <coughs> this, this Hold is, your questions, we'll get to it. This, this is phase one. And as this goes along, the way these healthcare systems actually operate, or a lot of them operate, is that they have they have large contracts with insurance companies. <coughs> and what they do is, if, if they accept you as a physician into, say, Advocate uh, Physician Health Partners, or APP, uh, 
you can share with their contracts. So if they are contracting with 20 insurance companies on behalf of 600 doctors, obviously the rates are better than me as a solo practitioner. I'm a solo practitioner. So in order to continue to participate in these contracts with the healthcare system, you must sign on to their ACO, and you can only sign on to one, and you must participate in this Medicare Shared Savings Program. And to do that, they are asking us, he, he, they came short of requiring, you know, we're, we're smart people, we know where this is going. They want the names and addresses of the Medicare patients so they can send you information about having all of your care done in their hospital. And if you had one or two visits in one of their institutions, one of their uh, uh, hospitals, um, when you get hospitalized at other places, your information will be shared. So I'm not, sing I'm not singling out advocate by any stretch. I, I think they're just trying to, to go as fast as they can to try to implement this. And I'm sure other places around the country are doing it. I'm on staff at six hospitals in the area. Um, and again, uh, they seem to be uh, further ahead than anybody else. But th this is phase one. Be prepared. Our last guest speaker, and I, I got I'm, I'm going to hold him to a firm four minutes because he could go on for four hours. Stephen Tucker in the insurance industry knows probably more about this law than anybody I've ever met. Steve Tucker. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Uh, he's right. I could go on for an hour. I won't let him. He, he will not let me. Uh, I want to just cover three main basic things today about Obamacare, and I apologize for calling Obamacare. Actually, I don't because when the President spends $1.5 million of our taxes to put the term Obamacare on top of Yahoo and Google, I will call it Obamacare, even though it's the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. There are three things I want to tell you. The number one is that the President promised us before this health care legislation was passed that the average premium for a family of four would be lower by $2,500. Who remembers him saying that? Okay. Uh, in the last two years since it's passed, I have seen the highest health insurance rate increases in 17 years of this business. And my clients are calling and screaming and blaming me. Now when I say high health insurance premiums, I'm not just going to give you the statement. I brought with me premium increase statements for my clients. I brought them in my pocket. I'm going to share with you from the smallest to the highest. This is Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois. Okay. The lowest premium increase, 31.35%. Understand that historically, the rate increases for my clients are between 8 and 10%, and that's in a bad year. Let's keep going. 30.17%, 35.63%, and drum roll please, 44.78%. Now, what happens when an insurance company raises the premiums by almost 45%? Do you think that that insured kept his policy? I can tell you that he didn't. And the very first step is to do what? Remove employees from the plan because you can no longer afford it or terminate the plan altogether. Our friends on the left love to use the narrative that it is the insurance company's evil profits that have caused these health insurance premiums to increase. It is because they are greedy, they want people to quote unquote die in the streets. I'm going to tell you something, and it's not, it's not unusual and it's actually on purpose that you've not seen a health insurance broker interviewed anywhere, not on Fox News, not on MSNBC, not on any news outlet since this legislation passed. You've heard from doctors, who are very knowledgeable, but you've not heard from a health and church broker. And the reason that that is, is because the president is a liar. And it pains me to say my president has lied to me. But today and yesterday and about a week, he's been repeating a lie he told in 2008. And that lie was that his mother was denied coverage for cancer under her health insurance plan. When it was proven in 2009, that that was a lie. 
and that what he was referring to was his mother's disability policy, which has nothing to do with cancer care or with the fact about pre-existing conditions. So, and it's even worse because who acted as her attorney through that whole event with the problem with her disability policy, not her health insurance policy? A young attorney named Barack Obama. So there's no way he couldn't know the truth. And that really points to the character of a man who could tell a lie about a sensitive situation with his mother's health. It really bothers me. But that's not the only isolated issue. The biggest lie the president told was the lie of pre-existing conditions. I want you to know why we have pre-existing conditions and why health insurance companies can deny people and how many of those people they deny. 90% of the American insured in this country are protected under a law that was passed in 1996 called HIPAA law. Who has heard of HIPAA law? The first thing you think about when you think about HIPAA law is what? Privacy. <laughs> By the way, that's gone with the new accountable characterization. Rich will attest to that. HIPAA privacy is dead. Your medical information will now be shared with HHS to determine whether or not the treatment you're going to get is accountable, affordable, and should be paid for. There's a far more important clause with HIPAA, and that is portability. When they passed 1996 HIPAA portability law, it stated that people who have health insurance on group insurance, not individual, employer-sponsored group insurance, if they maintain that coverage for 18 months and they lose that job, therefore lose that health insurance coverage, when they move to another group health insurance plan, as long as they don't have a lapse between 63 days between this employer plan and this employer plan, this employer plan must provide coverage for all pre-existing conditions with no waiting period covered from day one. That is why when you leave a former employer, they send you what? A certificate, say it, of creditable coverage. That protects 90% of the American insurance. But as usual, the central planning status that reside in Washington, D.C., excluding this one, when they pass legislation, they never do it the right way. And when they passed HIPAA portability law, they either forgot, which I don't believe, or purposely did not extend HIPAA portability protection to individual policyholders. You know, the backbone of this country, small business owners, usually mom and pops, they don't have enough employees to come to an insurance company and negotiate rates because they have enough lives to spread the risk around them. So they buy what's called individual health insurance policies. Individual health insurance policies, thanks to government, thanks to the legislators who wrote federal HIPAA portability, look it up, in 96, they extended no protection for pre-existing to individual policyholders. None. So when you go apply for individual health insurance, yes, you can be denied because you're too heavy, because you, are, you have three different medications you take, because you have a serious history of mental illness, because you have heart disease in your head. They will, and they can, and it is legal to deny the <coughs> coverage. Why? Because of the government who wrote that legislation. Do you know how you fix pre-existing conditions? <coughs> Not 2,700 page healthcare legislation, double space, 960 single space, I'm referring to the PPACA, Obamacare. It takes one sentence added to existing federal head of law. That sentence says, write a drum roll please, all individual plans are now protected under existing federal HIPAA portability law. And we have solved pre-existing conditions in this country forever. So, if it only takes one sentence to solve pre-existing conditions, what are the other 2,600 pages about? They are about control. One minute, Mr. Control. I want to share one last thing with you. And we'll go into Q&A. <laughs> Medicare. Medicare. Oh, you know why health insurance premiums are so high? Because of government. In 1979, there were 279 mandates placed on health insurance companies to say, if you operate in this state, you want to sell health insurance, guess what? you got to cover cancer. That sounds reasonable, right? Who would like to guess how many mandates we have on health insurance policies now post-Obamacare? 2,100. That sounds like a big number. 
I brought them with me. Excuse me. Here they all are. Those are the 2,100 mandates placed on health insurance policies in this country. And they're not all medically necessary. For instance, Illinois, infertility, hair plugs, health club memberships. Why are we paying for things that we should not have to pay for? They're not medically necessary. I don't have the right plumbing below my navel to have a baby. But I've got to pay for infertility because I live in Illinois. That is not medically necessary. Last, Medicare. Politicians don't want to touch the third real politics, which is Medicare. Guess what? I'm not a politician. So I'm going to step all over it today. The Democrats, including Joe's opponent, Tammy Duckworth, like to say the Republicans are going to change Medicare as we know it. Let me tell you something. Medicare's already been changed as we know it. In fact, Medicare was destroyed with Obamacare. You remember Representative Paul Ryan saying that $569 billion was taken from Medicare, right? I would like you to replace the $569 billion number with $4.95 trillion. Because according to the chief Medicare actuary of Medicare, Richard Foster, his assessment, Obamacare will decimate the Medicare. Over the first 20 years, it will cut $4.95 trillion from Medicare. And worse than that, it will reduce the reimbursement ratio that the government pays to doctors who still take Medicaid. Because in Illinois, they don't. A lot of them don't take it anymore. They've been paid for two years. But those who still do, those who take Medicare, will now be given less reimbursement from the government than doctors who still take Medicaid. You know, the ones who like to work for free. What does that mean? Two studies you'll never hear about, except for right here. University of Virginia, 2005. They did a study to find out people on Medicaid, what is their survival ratio when they have surgery on Medicaid compared to a patient who has surgery with private health insurance? 50% more likely to die after that surgery. Why? Why? Because the doctors aren't being paid, so you're not going to get follow-up care. Fast forward, last thing I'll say, Joe. No, you're fine. Fast forward, 2009, University of Virginia. As soon as that study came out, government, oh, we got to fix it. Get it, 50% more people likely to die in surgery. Amen? Here's what we'll do. We'll put more big government on that and get it fixed. 2009, fast forward, University of Virginia. Guess what the likelihood is, percentage-wise, when you have surgery on Medicaid, to die now compared to people with private health insurance? Can someone say 97%? Now, when you feel like, we just found out what from, from the CBO and from uh, Mitch McConnell's report, 25 million more Americans will be shoved and auto-enrolled onto Medicaid because Obamacare raises the eligibility for Medicaid 400% higher than existing. So a family of four can get out there making 90000 a year. And they can have their health insurance paid for by the few, the proud, the 53% who pay taxes in this country. So you shove 25 million people onto an already bankrupt <coughs> Medicaid system. What did Sarah Palin say? That's all I have. Okay, folks, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put our two guys and our insurance expert up here. Let's let's open this up to Q&A, because now I wanna hear from you guys. Um, hold on one sec, I'll come to you first. Do Hey, our illustrious panel. I'm gonna have, I'm gonna be the game show host here. I'm gonna have a firm hand. Do your best to keep your questions brief. Brief. Do your best to keep your answers brief. I want to hear from as many folks as possible. I'm doing this for a very important re reason. It's not a selfish reason. I'm telling you guys, there is not a more important issue in this election than this. Let's hear from as many people as we can. Start us. Yes, which is unfunded drug plan. Uh, this plan pays a minimum of 400% more for drugs than, say, what the VA pays for their drugs. Uh, most drugs are made outside the United States, but it's illegal to import drugs from Canada. I'd love to know why you aren't going against the George Bush <coughs> unfunded drug program. What do you, what do you say? Anybody, you say? Anybody want to weigh in on this it's issue? It's a disaster. Okay. The difference between he's got a plan. 
The difference between the Republican Party, most of them, excluding this one, and the Democrat Party is that the Republican Party just wants to control spending their way. A lot of them don't have a problem with cutting spending. A lot of them pass massive entitlement programs like Medicare Part D that was unfunded from the beginning. Never had any money in the first place to fund it. Now it is even more bankrupt. So I, I don't know where Joe stands on it. I vehemently against Medicare Part D because it was an unfunded liability. Our unfunded liabilities in this country are at $65 trillion. Between Social Security, which FDR promised would be put in a, quote, lockbox, and was robbed for every other expenditure. Medicare, Medicaid, and now you put Part D on top of it. It's not just the Democrats that spend deficit spending recklessly without accountability. It is also many members of the Republican Party. Rich Dennis, anybody want to I'm a little more pragmatic. I make the drugs cheaper. And you do that by reducing liability. You gotta understand, without our medicines, we're witch doctors. Okay? We need those guys to do research and development to have new drugs. But make it cheaper. Get the lawyers off our backs. Uh, there was just a law recently passed where uh, generic drugs sold in the United <coughs> States, uh, you, there's no tort. I mean that you cannot sue someone if you get uh, something happens to you with uh, generic drugs. Could you comment on that? Well, again, as long as there's government oversight to, to check this. Years ago, there was a company making immunizations like tetanus and the flu shot. And they were getting sued so much. They said, we're going out of business. <coughs> the government said, wait a minute. So they upped the price of the medicine. They put that money into a fund in case you get uh, a bad reaction. You don't sue, you get the money out of that fund. Unfortunately, you still need a lawyer to get that money. I don't understand why. Again. Well, comment on generic drugs. Why aren't they being Briefly, sued? briefly. Why aren't they what? Why, why can't uh, you uh, sue a company, and say if it's made in India or something, and it's a defective drug, you can't sue it if it's a generic drug. And that's a recent law. You should know about that. That's, uh, I just recently heard about that, but again, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't. Let's hop around. Yes, sir. I might be over my balance here, but. Then you're in a good place. Yes, I am. <laughs> what, I've, what I've heard is starting January 1st, 2013, any monies that are deposited into a bank or withdrawn from a bank 1% of those funds are being taxed to the government with the guys for health care and some other things. What's going on here? I never told anybody to take out 1% of my funds every time I touch it. Let me answer this because this is political. There's a reason why less and less people now support Obamacare than when it was passed. And when it was passed, the American people didn't support it. Every single week, we've learned something bad that's in that bill, the 2,000-some pages. <clears throat> Again, it's always so easy to make fun of what Nancy Pelosi said. Politicians on both sides of the aisle do this. They pass these big things, and they don't know what's in it. There were a lot of things that were put into Obamacare purely to raise money. We repealed one of them last year, uh, the 1099 thing charging you $600 every time you have to fill out a paperwork for a 1099. That's another one, 1% on any bank transaction. We've all heard about the 3% on any real estate transaction that will kick in sometime soon. There are revenue raisers in this bill that most politicians didn't know were in there, and they have nothing to do with health care. They're only put in there to raise money, to raise tax money. Now, I'll tell you this, though. I think we got to repeal the whole thing, or I think we're sunk. But every time we find one of these really embarrassing things in this bill, even many Democrats join us and say, oh, we got to get rid of that. I mean, we repealed the Class Act, the long-term care piece of Obamacare, because even the Obama administration admitted it's not sustainable. There's more where that came from. Yes, sir. <coughs> Great statement and question. Your statement comes as follows. The successful abortion program of our government has killed enough children that would already more than pay for all of this social security and the rest of it infinite provided different jobs of them and the state. Your question. The question is, Obamacare is already taking place here, inserting pieces of it already. Uh, as you may not be aware of it, my wife runs a major medical office, but they're now asking for your social security number and other information when you come in as a patient that's illegal and they're steering this stuff to where it's going to be shed, fed straight to go via the EMR, the Electronic Medical Records Program. Uh, 
Uh, Any comment, Dr. Dennis? That, that's absolutely correct. In, in fact, uh, you know, we as uh, uh, private medical practices were uh, effectively forced to go EMR, electronic medical record. And, and don't get me wrong, it, it, it does make our lives easier and it makes it easier to interact with patients. And it, and it does save some money, but what they're effectively gonna use it for is to track you. And if you're a Medicare patient and you're receiving funds from the government, they will know what you're doing, what you're not doing. And you know, like I said before, we're all smart people that the government will use that information. And, and that that is correct. Yes, ma'am. Stand up and be loud. You just mentioned, you know, when you were talking about that, okay, so be prepared. What are people supposed to do? What are people I supposed to do? Basically tell them go away, I'm not gonna give you my information. Oh. Wow. Okay, hold on though. It's a great, that's a great answer. Obviously, this is it. Get involved politically. But as a patient moving forward, how are patients supposed to be reacting in this new world where the government's trying to get at their information? Right. That, that's a as, wonderful. As a single practitioner, I can pretty much yeah. tell the government to go so far at this sure. point because I'm so small. As much as they hassled me. Sure. I'm too small for them to really take a whole lot of time and really pester me. But I've had requests for records. And I, you know, we get the, the requests all the time to go electronic. And it's like, no, we're not doing it. We don't have to. But the point is, is that when the patient comes in the door, I want to be able to say to that patient, look, you don't have to provide this, this information, not only here, but anywhere else. Can you do that now? What the, it, it's it's great that saying. you're saying that because I had the same conversation, almost the same statement that you're saying with, with a group of friends <laughs> who are also physicians. I said, my God, I'm not going to do this. I, you know, and I started talking to my patient. I think this meeting was Tuesday. And by Wednesday, Thursdays in my clinic, in my clinics, I see 200 people a week in clinic right along. And, it, it, and at least 15, 20 people in the hospital every day. I see a lot of people. And I'm thinking, my God, how do I let people know? And you know what I've opted to do is I've opted to we're putting together a letter and we're saying look we're you know we're effectively we're not being forced but we're being wink wink encouraged nudged, nudged to provide this information and, and and I would provide the uh, phone number for the, the local uh, Congress people for the patients to call oh. and complain. Um, what's your practice? Uh, Obamacare B six eight. What's your biggest fear? Cuts in the medic, cuts in the Medicare reimbursement. Cuts in Medicare yeah, reimbursement. She's already, she's already stopped taking most Medicaid. You've, You've already stopped, stopped taking most Medicaid. Med Medicaid. And is that for really common, guys? For, 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 for the hearing, for the hearing aid. You don't take Medicaid. No, neither do I. Well, I mean, for your reason, that I'll, that I'll put in electronic billing, and it takes four to six months to get reimbursed. You know, Massachusetts has, has an answer for that. Hold on. Uh, they're trying to pass two pieces of legislation in Massachusetts where Romney care exists, okay? Which was the impetus for Obamacare. Don't get uh, <laughs> They're trying to pass two pieces of legislation because doctors there also, like Illinois, have not been paid under Medicaid. So those two pieces of legislation state that if you're a licensed physician and you refuse to work for free anymore, we're going to pull your medical license. <laughs> this brave new world. Let's go here first and then I'll go there. Yes, sir. You Use that mic if you can. Turn it on. It is on. Uh, I can't uh, hear a word you say. That doesn't work. You, you may have to uh, shout out a little louder. <laughs> what, did he, what did he say? What can I do to help out the community? To help out the community? Go work for the hospital. Volunteer for the hospital. Just go to any local hospital. They need help. They need volunteers. Good Great luck. thing to do. Yes, sir. Yeah, I got a question. My, uh, this is the stuff that's flying under the radar. One of the largest cardiologist group as of January in the Northwest Burp sold out to Lexi Brothers. Okay, you're not hearing this stuff. They didn't want to deal with the new, the cardiologist group that I go to. Okay, and I blame actually, and I love what you've been doing, but I, I actually put a lot of it on the Republicans too, because they're not framing the debate against this guy. Right. And this stuff is not being pointed out. This and they don't want to deal with it. I played golf with one of the guys, and he says, I'm not working for that deal anymore. We're going to sell out. We're going to take a payout. 